Why produce a video for a book review? Well, you got to see this thing, not just read about it. I haven't been this delighted with a book as a physical object in decades. Written by the art critic Zoe Lascaze, this book was directed and produced by Benedict Toshin. Note, it says directed and produced, not edited and published. In this case, I think it's an apt description. The production starts before you even open the book. The jacket sports an embossed close-up of the Permian reptile Aino Strancevia, painted by the Soviet artist Alexei Petrovich Bistrov in 1933. Its skin even glitters when you get the light just right. No space goes to waste in paleo art. The inside of the cover presents a dramatic black and white scene of a nightmarish former world. The table of contents opens up into a panorama, and even the bibliography is a must-see. There are other fold-outs throughout the book, and overall the reproduction of the artwork is simply outstanding. In this close-up of the head of a hadrosaur from Alexander Mikhailovich Balashov's 1984 mosaic Tree of Life, the photographer cleverly lighted the subject from the side so the creature practically jumps off of the page. As an art critic, Lascaze brings a welcome perspective to this material as opposed to a narrow exposition of scientific content. Here's her caption for Iguanodon bernisartensis by Zenik Burian in 1962. Many of Burian's later works look either rushed or oppressively labored. This painting is not his strongest. The central dinosaur is stiff, the pine trees schematic. Still, certain passages sing, and Burian at least appears to have enjoyed rendering the creature's head. There, he experimented with using the blunt end of his brush to etch away wet paint, revealing bright green and mustard yellow. Or how about this take on paleo art in the Soviet Union? Soviet paleo artists enjoyed freedoms that fine artists, whose output was so carefully controlled by the state, could not. They were not beholden to any one official narrative, and their magnificent visions of prehistory represent a rich, imaginative vein of Soviet-era imagery that has been largely overlooked. The graphic depiction of what we now call Deep Time has a specific starting date. In 1830, Henry de la Beche, the first director of the British Geological Survey, painted the watercolor Duria Antiquior, portraying the Jurassic world of Dorset, England. This painting is well known to geologists and paleontologists, but what I didn't know before reading this book was the story behind its printing and distribution. In the book's introduction, Lascaze writes, But de la Beche did not draft Duria Antiquior with grand ambitions in mind. When the geologist sat down to draw the animals that had once lived and died above Dorset, he was simply trying to help a friend. That friend was Mary Anning, one of the greatest fossil collectors of her time. By 1830, Anning was in desperate financial straits, and de la Beche sold lithographs of Duria Antiquior for the princely sum of two pounds ten, with the proceeds going to Anning. Each chapter brings new stories about familiar art, or highlights artists you may not have heard of. Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins' sculptures for the Crystal Palace exhibition can still be seen in London today but I had no idea he was preparing a similar installation for New York's Central Park when Boss Tweed's thugs broke in and destroyed his New York studio. Charles R. Knight was one of America's most famous painters of the ancient past. Turns out his vision was so bad that he couldn't see his own murals once he climbed down off the scaffolding. Lascaze is dismissive of modern efforts in paleo art, and doesn't include any work newer than 1990 in the book. That gives me an idea for a follow-up video, but for a little more than $40 on Amazon, this thing is an absolute steal. A must-have for fossil fans, science nerds in general, and even open-minded art connoisseurs.